is Roberta Silman, and I've lived in Great Barrington since 1973 as a second homeowner for more than 40 years. And for the last four and a half years, I have been a permanent resident. That was, my husband died in 2018. Uh, his name was Robert Silman. And um, I decided that this was really home. So that's why I've been here permanently since then. I would, I'd like to talk today about my new novel, Summer Lightning, but first I would like to tell you a little bit about me and how I became a fiction writer. I was born at the end of 1934 in Brooklyn, the eldest of three girls. My father was an immigrant from Lithuania, and my mother was the only one to be born in the United States, uh, also from an immigrant family. Dad came to this country in 1922, and they married in 1932. When I was almost eight, we moved to a small town on the southern shore of Long Island. Although this was in the middle of the Second World War, and as a Jewish child, I was very aware of what was happening in Europe, I have to say that for the most part, it was a contented, quiet childhood, filled with school, music lessons, and camp in the summers in the Berkshires, and an awareness that although we were girls, we were headed for college and expected to make a contribution to society. In 1952, I went to Cornell University, and on the first day of college, I met the young boy, also from a small town on Long Island, who would become my husband soon after we graduated in 1956. Both of us had been sent to college by parents who wanted lawyers, who, parents who were also not college educated, but still wanted lawyers. However, what parents want is sometimes not always the best route. While at Cornell, we had each veered in different directions. Bob was more interested in the built environment, and I fell in love with English literature. Although our parents were somewhat disappointed, we had each other for support, and that meant a great deal as we moved forward. After Bob completed a six-month stint in the Army in Fort Lee in Virginia, we returned home, got jobs, and settled in a small apartment in Queens. But within two years, my young husband realized that although he would always be, always be grateful for his liberal arts education, his interests lay elsewhere. He was working for a contractor and reading as many architectural magazines as he could. Finally, in 1958, he decided he wanted to get a second bachelor's degree in structural engineering. So he went back to school full time while I continued to work at the Saturday Review magazine where I had gotten a job. I had started there as a secretary, but was now assistant to the science editor. In 1960, my, uh, Bob graduated with that second bachelor's degree, and I got an offer from the New York Times to write a weekly science column for them. It was time they had decided for a woman to write about science. It was a great offer and everybody wanted me to take it. But that's when I realized I wanted to pursue a different route. Since we also wanted a family, I could try to write fiction while the children were napping or sleeping. When I told the person interviewing me my plan, he smiled and confessed that he had wanted to write fiction too. Then he wished me good luck. I have never regretted that decision. I began with stories because I could see the end and where I needed to go. A lot of women began writing fiction by writing stories, and at that time, there were plenty of places to publish, not only the literary magazines like The New Yorker and The Atlantic, but also the women's magazines like McCall's, Red Book, Mademoiselle, Cosmopolitan. So all through the 60s, when I was caring for the three children born in 1961, 1966, and 1968, I would get up very early in the morning and sit at my desk for an hour or two and write while they were napping or in nursery school, and then more regularly when they started to go to school all day. Although I had only rejection slips to show for my efforts, I also had a husband who understood that I had a real passion, who treated me as an equal, and who had expectations that I would pursue that passion. Although I didn't have a clue then, I realized over time that I was a very lucky woman and that my very supportive husband was a rarity. 
However, the 1960s were also filled with unexpected things that pushed the fiction aside. Bob was offered a wonderful opportunity to work for the greatest engineering company in the world, Ove Arabs in London, so we went to England for a year. Soon after we returned, he started his own engineering firm as a single practitioner in 1966. And then there was the national turmoil, the civil rights movement, the assassinations, the women's movement that were all part of our lives during those tumultuous years. But by the early 70s, the children were in school most of the day, and that's when my path toward fiction took an important turn. A friend called to tell me that she was going to get her MFA in social work. And suddenly, I, who had never been jealous of anyone, was green with envy. All I had to show for my efforts were those rejection slips mentioned above. I, I'm not sure I mentioned them, but I intended to. Um, moreover, I had not shown my work to anyone but my husband, who, as he reminded me when we talked, had no idea if my work had any value. But he suspected it did, and that's when he made the suggestion that I apply to graduate school to see if anybody thought it was worth printing. Sarah Lawrence had just started its MFA program in creative writing as a graduate program. So he said, almost casually, it's only 20 minutes away. Why don't you apply? I did, and Grace Paley read my work and took me on as a graduate student. But it was what she said to me when we met that made all the difference. She said, Roberta, you are already a writer, a good writer. Suddenly, I had found my place in the world. Grace Paley was a great American writer who died <clears throat> in 2007, I think, um, born in 1922. And for those of you who know her work and love it as I do, you might be interested in my essay about her that was first published in The American Scholar in 2008 and just reprinted in the online magazine Arts Views. I got my MFA in 1975, and during that time, I began to publish my stories in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Red Book, and others. My master's thesis was essentially my first book of stories, Blood Relations. Here it is. Um, never went to paper, but it is available as an eBay book on Amazon. This was a group of family stories, some autobiographical, some not, but a book deeply concerned with the connections people make with each other. My first novel, Boundaries, is about a young wid widow with three children who embarks on a second chapter of her life with a very unlikely man. That came along in 1975. I'm sorry, 1979. Then there were fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. I also received the National Magazine Award and awards from Penn and other places. My second novel, The Dream Dredger, centered around a drowning in the Hudson River. Whether it was a suicide or an accidental death was what it concerned itself with, and it was published in 1986. Although a famous critic once said that people write from desperation or revenge, I found myself in these three books writing about what I feared or did not truly understand. I had been lucky enough to have been able to attend the famous lectures of the great writer Vladimir Nabokov when I was at Cornell, and I never forgot his view on the purpose of fiction. It was to produce tingles in the reader an emotional response so strong that you could actually feel goose flesh or hair standing on end. Reviews of these first three books confirm that I was a writer who could do that. But very few people make anything like a living writing fiction. I have been lucky because my husband had begun to make his name as an imaginative structural engineer and his firm grew, and he was soon learning enough to support the family without me having to work. Many of the writers I knew had to teach, which, though satisfying, was also draining and didn't leave much time for their own work. In 1990, my third novel, Beginning the World Again, 
was published. It's about the people who went to Los Alamos to work on the atomic bomb. It was a huge undertaking and required more research than I had ever done, as well as a good working knowledge of the physics so important in atomic research. My husband was an active participant in all this, and we took the children on a memorable trip to New Mexico to get the feel of Los Alamos, which remarkably had not changed very much since the 1940s. Some of the scientists who had worked on the bomb there were also still teaching at Cornell. And when they found out about my project, they kindly invited to me to talk with them and gave me invaluable information about what the families had endured in that lonely, secretive place. By the early 1990s, I began to work on my fourth novel, Secrets and Shadows, which begins with the fall of the Berlin Wall and explores the long-range effects of the Holocaust on a marriage. By then, my children had gone to college and married, and in the early 2000s had two children of their own. Also by then, a lot of the outlets for stories had closed shop. In addition, my agent of many years called one day and said, we were done. I was too old, too Jewish, no one was interested in another Holocaust novel, and she was more interested now in younger writers. I knew enough about the nature of the publishing business not to crumble at this sun, crumple at this sun turnaround. And most important, I knew I was a writer and would continue writing. I had stories published in quarterlies like the Virginia, Virginia Quarterly Review and The American Scholar. My husband also helped because he assured me that if I couldn't publish my novels in the mainstream, we would start our own little publishing company, and thus the work would see light. So Secrets and Shadows was published by our little LLC called Camden Hill Books in, 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 in 2018, and Summer Lightning was published last year in 2022. Despite my agent's skepticism, Secrets and Shadows, the novel about the Holocaust, whose main theme was that of forgiveness, got spectacular reviews and was named one of the best indie books of 2018 by Kirkus Reviews. No small thing. Before we get to Summer Lightning, I need to mention the other way I have stayed connected to fiction and the literary world. In 2008, I got another call asking if I was interested in doing reviews for an online magazine out of Boston called Arts Views. Although I had never taught or written many reviews, I was a great reader, especially of fiction. And this seemed a good way to keep my hand in the literary world and spread the word about books I loved. I have written for Arts Views for the last 15 years and can basically choose what books I want to review and what I want to write about them. My editor, Bill Marks, is a marvelous editor and makes sure there's always another book in the mail. That helps me feel connected to my world and also aware of the young writers who are coming along. And now a look at Summer Lightning. Here's the book. When I began to work on it in 2019, I realized that I had some long short stories that were actually parts of a novel. As I read them again, I saw that I could start with Lindbergh's flight in 1927. How the novel would end, I wasn't really sure, but that was part of the fun of getting down to writing it. By the time I finished, I had a book about three generations of a family that would span many of the important events of the 20th century. The first half of the book is quite autobiographical, with glimmers of my parents in the characters of Bell and Isaac, and, the, and there are glimmers of my grandparents in Malka and Avram. But the daughters, Sophie and Vivi, became more and more fictional as the book progressed. And the second half, about the choices both Belle and her daughters make, is very much made up. After writing Secrets and Shadows, 
which had some harrowing parts about one of the main characters being hidden in Germany during the Second World War. I also knew that I wanted to write something less heavy. Um, I wanted to write about a normal family, if there is such a thing. Not a family recovering from trauma, or a deeply dysfunctional family, or a family that had secrets about sexual assaults or murder. Just a family doing the best they could. I had always been struck by a line from a poem by, from the Russian poet Asip Mandelstam. How poor is the language of happiness it goes. In other words, how hard it is to convey happiness. I had always been intrigued by that, and I wanted to try. I also ended up using that poem as an epigraph for the novel. And I think I'd like to read it to you now. It's also, interestingly enough, about textiles. And since the protagonists of these bo this book have a curtain company, which my parents had, it, it seems an interesting choice. Here it is. A thing I love is the action of spinning, the shuttle fluttering back and forth, the hum of the spindle. And look, like a swan's down floating toward us, Delia, the barefoot shepherdess, flying. O oh, indigence at the root of our lives. How poor is the language of happiness. Everything's happened before and will happen again. But still, the moment of each meeting is sweet. So over the course of 19, 2019 and 2020, I created the three generations of the Kaplow family, a family that is always there for each other despite their differences, and that has values that my parents gave me and that I try to instill in my own children. A book that affirms life, which is so precious even in these troubled times, and a book that would give comfort as we try to recover from some of the political chaos we have been plunged into for almost a decade. A book that would show that not all of life is struggle and doom, but that it's about connections, about relationships, and how one maneuvers through life, strengthening or breaking those connections. As I got going, I realized I was also interested in the place of art in our lives, about who is an artist and who is not. Throughout the book, there is an art thread because the mother, Belle, ends up <coughs> collecting the rent from people like Larry Rivers and his friends, who were all very active participants in the New York art scene in the middle of the 20th century and whose lives were also very different from Bell and Isaac's suburban existence. And finally, as the daughters of this family grew up, I realized I had a story about race. Suddenly, those characters who are trying to make a decent living, educating their children, buying a second home in the Berkshires, are confronted with a challenge to their ideals. Their quirky, beautiful, and talented daughter has fallen in love with a black man, which wasn't so surprising considering that the girls were brought up by very liberal parents and also a black maid whose brand of folk wisdom, wisdom echoes in their heads very often as they emerge into adulthood. An interracial affair in the 1960s was a much bigger deal than it is today. But as the story evolved, I realized I needed to tell Vivi and Herbert's story and that their bravery was worth writing about. But I also wanted to show how Vivi's parents and her sister Sophie and Sophie's husband Michael dealt with this new predicament. So we have a novel that charts a family's trajectory over 40 years, buffeted by public events over which they have no control but who can remain true to their principles as they figure out their private lives. One reviewer really got it when he said, 
What will resonate most with readers is Sim Silman's intensely emotional depiction of the Kaplau's commitment to family and helping others. Silman portrays the Kaplau's as genuine people who managed to instill true integrity in their children. If fiction is the history of the world, as I think it is, this seems a worthy goal to attain while writing it. So Summer Lightning is more than a rags to riches immigrant novel. It has layers that give it depth and in the end tells a story that gives us hope in the future. Before I read a passage from the beginning of the book, I want to say a few words about my process. Writing fiction is a mysterious business. You never know when an idea for a story or a longer piece will come, and you wait eagerly for that to happen. It's what keeps us writers alive. But writing is also a craft, like any other. And if you write regularly, as I try to do almost every day, you get better at it. Over time, I have learned how words can create a world, whether I am working on a novel or a story or a review. And I'm grateful to have honed that gift all these years and still be able to do it. Now, here is a scene from the beginning of the story in Summer Lightning when Bela, who has not yet changed her name to Belle, spies the man whom he, she will marry at Roosevelt Field when Lindbergh embarks on his historic flight over the Atlanta. At this point, Bela is very young, only a senior in high school. May 20th, 1927. Bela clasped, clasped her thin spring coat close, desperately hoping the smoky mist would not become rain again. You could hardly see the grass. Just as her teeth were beginning to chatter, something was placed on her shoulders. Quickly, she turned. A smallish man, a stranger, was backing be away behind her. What are you doing? You were shivering. I'm sorry if I offended you or frightened you. That was hardly my intention. George, who had convinced her to come here today, was staring at them, too timid to protest, too stupid to give her his jacket. All he could do was ask Bela, are you OK? But the man seemed harmless, and she had to admit she felt a lot better as she snuggled under the coat. Still, it was eerie, a stranger giving her his coat, while his velvet brown eyes took in her features so slowly that Bela felt he was memorizing her face. Later, she realized his gaze had a boldness that should have made her afraid. Instead, it warmed her. At last, George reacted, this is my girlfriend. Then someone yelled, here he is, and nothing mattered but the tall person approaching the plane. Handsome, young, unbelievably determined. He's deluded, nothing more than a Don Quixote tilting at wind windmills, one newspaper reported. Stars in his eyes, another wrote. And does he have a west death wish, a third asked. But they'd never seen him, Baylor realized. Those flinty blue eyes, that stubborn stance, the confident tent tilt of his head, the confident tilt of his head. Surely he knew he, he could die. Even more surely he had to be afraid. How could he not be afraid? Yet none of that came through as he flicked his glance toward the crowd. She wanted to reach out and touch him, convince him to give up this folly. But she was dreaming, no one could do that. Then an older woman broke ra ranks, wait, calling, wait, she handed him something. It's a St. Christopher medal. It will bring you luck. Nodding, Lindbergh stuffed it in his pocket. Let's hope she's right. Such a long journey all alone, the stranger said, his soft voice holding all the worry that Bela felt. How will he find his way, Bela asked. He has 450 gallons of fuel, and he'll have the stars. She wanted to ask more, but George was pushing her forward to see Lindbergh wave and lift himself grace gracefully into the plane. Finally, the engine whirred, and the spirit of St. Louis skidded and bumped along the rutted track. Bela's breath caught, and her palms grew clammy as until the plane began to climb. 
utter silence as it headed for the telephone wires. Shouts of fear, then relief as it pulled itself up, skimming the wires and gaining altitude. Despite the warm coat enfolding her, Bela began to shiver again. Soon the play, plane moved slowly upward, a deep shush as it vanished into the fog. In voices as wobbly as the little aircraft, the plane began. The crowd began to cheer, their voices growing stronger as it appeared once more then became a speck in the vast sky. At some point, the coat was lifted off her so shoulders so lightly she didn't even know when, and as she turned, the stranger was already walking away. He had put the coat back on, and a friend was slapping him on the shoulder. Although she couldn't hear what they were saying, Bela fixed his well-shaped head in her mind and saw that he had an attractive, e even for featured profile and a neat, almost black mustache. She wanted to call out to him, but George had grabbed her elbow again. That guy had some nerve. His coat kept me warm. At that moment, the stranger turned and raised his hand in a slight wave. George shrugged and propelled her towards the bus. She looked at her watch. She'd be late to school. The stranger filled her mind. Why did she feel such a catch in her throat? She reminded herself that he'd had a thick Europe, Eastern European ac accent, hardly what she wanted. She had long ago decided she was going to marry an American, not some stupid greenhorn. But she kept hearing the soft timbre of his voice as he said, and he'll have the stars, and his eyes were the kindest she had ever seen. So um, I just wanted to mention that Summer Lightning and all the other books are available um, both at the Lennox Bookstore um, and also called The Bookstore and also um, on Amazon. And you can hear or learn more about me um, on, um, at my website, www.robertasilman.com. And um, all these books, except for Blood Relations, are available as audiobooks on Audible. Mm -hmm.